In this video, we're going to talk about cold calling fundamentals. And before we talk about the strategy and the theory behind it, we first need to start off at the basics and define what it is. So what is a cold call? Well, a cold call very simply is calling a raise after there's been a bet in one or more raises. And in preflop raise, a cold call can occur in a single raise pot or a three bet pot or a four bet pot or even a five bet pot. Now, why do we have within this definition where there has been a bet and one or more raises? Well, in No Limit Hold'em, remember we have the blinds. The blinds are that first initial force bet. So that's why we have this in here within the definition. And then after that, the actions on other players, they can either fold, they can limp, or they can raise. And then after there's been a raise, there's an option for somebody to call. And that first call is considered a cold call. So when a player raises preflop and then somebody else calls, meaning the first person to call calls, that is what we consider a cold call. Then if somebody calls after that initial call, that's not a cold call, that's called an overcall. And we'll talk about that in a later section. So I just wanted to do our basic definition. So now that you know what a cold call is, let's talk about something very important called the gap concept. Now David Slansky coined this and it's very detailed and I just pulled some basic information out of it in regards to what's applicable to the microstakes and our microstakes cash games that I think you need to understand. So let's talk about the gap concept. So the gap concept states that you need a stronger hand to call a raise than to make a raise yourself. And if that doesn't make sense, hopefully it will by the end of this lecture. So the whole idea behind this gap concept is that when somebody raises preflop and we're considering calling, we should call with hands that play well against our opponent's perceived open raising range. And I have this shown down here in the diagram. We'll talk about this once we talk about these two other bullet points. So in the eyes of the gap concept, we should typically call with hands that are near the upper echelon of our opponent's perceived open raising range, but they aren't good enough for us to three bet for value. So we don't want to be calling with hands that are at the bottom of the range because we want our hands to do well against the range. And of course, we're going to three bet our strongest hands. So it all comes down to three betting our strongest hands, calling with hands that are strong, but they're not strong enough to three bet and folding our weakest hands. So and that gets down to the third point. So we should fold hands that we believe are dominated by our opponent's opening range. And here's the diagram below. So here's the Razor's range. So they have their weakest hands all the way up to the strongest hands within their range. So we consider, you know, for example, we could consider a button open raising range. We could consider a under the gun open raising range. They're going to have a spectrum of hands. And so they raise with their entire range of hands. And we have to consider that range of hands before we call. And so our calling range from the idea of the gap concept is that, well, of course, with our strongest value hands that we think we can three bet for value, well, we're going to three bet them for value. But we also have hands that are near the bottom and there are weakest hands. We're like, oh, well, this is a crap hand. This is not going to play well against their open raising range. So I'm just going to fold this hand. And then there are the hands that are in the middle. And these are our calling range. And I'll just go ahead and put a little blue box around this. And these are hands that aren't strong enough for us to three bet. But equity wise and playability wise and other things, they're going to do well against the open raisers range. And those are the hands that we want to call. And that's the whole idea of the gap concept. So we have our three betting hands that are the strongest. We have our hands that aren't good enough to three bet, but they play well against our opponent's range so we can call. And then we have the hands that are just too weak to call and we just fold them. So that's the gap concept in regards to cold calling. Now this also is applicable to overcalling as well when you're whenever you're considering calling. 
you want to consider this concept, not just cold calling, but also over calling as well. So with that said, let's talk about some basic cold calling considerations. So whenever you're considering calling a race preflop, I want you to think about these considerations, these criteria before you make that call. And this all comes down to you understanding the game and looking at this criteria rather than just saying, okay, here's a range of hands and I should call with this range of hands. Yeah, I'm going to provide you ranges, but you need to think about all this criteria. So let's take a look at them. And we actually have slides for each of them. So we want to look at our equity edge. We want to look at if we have good or bad implied odds. We want to look at our post flop playability edge. We want to look at our opponent's open raise sizing. And then lastly, we want to look at the players left to act. So let's take a look at our equity edge. So in regards to our first consideration, when we believe our hand has an equity edge versus our opponent's open raising range, but it's not strong enough for us to three bet for value, well, this is a, a very good candidate hand for a call, for a cold call specifically when we're talking about cold calling. And so if we take a look at the gap concept, so for example, our opponent is opening under the gun with a 12% range in both of these examples. And I'll just highlight the top one, exact same range. And in regards to these, in the first example, we have ace queen suited. In the second example, we have king 10 suited. And of course, on the table while you're playing, you're not gonna be able to do this analysis, but as you get more experience, you're gonna understand what type of hands are going to play well against specific ranges. But if we plug the numbers into an equity calculator like Equilab, what you're gonna find is that our equity with ace-queen suited is 53.29%, whereas our equity with king-10 suited is 41.51%. So it's a winning proposition equity-wise with ace-queen, and equity-wise with king-10, it's a losing proposition. So from the perspective of an equity edge and a gap concept, well, we should call with ace-queen suited, but we should fold with king-10 suited. Pretty basic, pretty straightforward. Um, but something like this is where experience comes into play and honing your ranges and knowing what ranges over time have an equity edge is something that you'll learn as you progress in the game and as you play with Equilab and you fine tune your ranges themselves. Now, this is not something you can actually do as you're playing, but I wanted to make sure we talked about this because this is an important point. It all comes down to our weaker hands, which is fold them because they're not strong enough to call with. So hands like king nine suited, king 10 suited, and so forth, hands that don't have an equity edge, just throw them in the muck and get rid of them. But hands that aren't good enough to three bet, but they have a good equity edge, then definitely a good candidate for a cold call. So the second thing that we need to consider is implied odds. So we talked about king 10 suited, throwing it into the muck. It's not always going to be as simple, as straightforward as that because we don't always have to have an equity edge versus our opponent's opening range. And when we don't have an equity edge, if we think that we can make up for that with good implied odds, then we can consider calling. So there's all sorts of things that we can talk to in regards to implied odds, but I went ahead and I put down a list of some important things that I think kind of highlight it for the most part. So some good implied odd situations include when the open raiser is playing a very strong range and is likely to commit a lot of chips post flop with his hand. So that gives us good implied odds because we know even though we have a weaker hand, but let's say we flop two pair with king 10 and our opponent has ace king. So maybe our opponent has ace king, we have king 10 and it flops king 10 deuce. Then we ended up out flopping our opponent, even though it's not gonna happen that often, but if that happens and we know that our opponent is going to commit all their chips post flop, then that's good implied odds. Now, when effective stack sizes are deep, such as 150 big blinds or deeper, we have good implied odds. And I would actually want to really see this deeper than 150 for a lot of you. So let's say 200 big blinds effective stacks or 300 big blinds effective stacks. Then we can start calling with all sorts of speculative types of hands to try to outflop our opponent because if we do, and we stack them for 300 big blinds, that's a huge positive result for us. 
The third one is that when there are bad recreational players left to act that are likely to call as well. So that bumps up the amount that we could win. So risk versus reward. So if we look at it and we, if we say, well, if we call, then there's two bad players that are left that are likely to call. I want to play against them as well. So that improves my implied odds. It gives me the likelihood that I'm going to win a lot of money if I make a good hand post flop. And then lastly, when we have a weaker hand that plays well and can make a very strong hand post flop, such as suited connectors, suited one gappers, small pocket pairs, and suited aces, well, all those types of hands also boost up our implied odds. And with the last bullet point as we progress in the course, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about with those. So the next thing we want to take a look at in regards to our considerations is our post flop playability edge. So that comes down to our skill advantage of our opponent. So if we suspect that the open raiser is opening a wide range preflop, then we can cold call with a wider range of hands to try to outplay our opponent's post flop. And let me just highlight the important point. And this is where our skill edge comes into play. So let's say our opponent is a weaker type of player. They're opening a wide range, but they don't play well post flop. Maybe we have position on them and then we can utilize skill advantage and positional advantage to try to outplay them post flop and take down the pot without going to showdown. So that's where our playability edge comes from. It comes from a combination of positional and skill advantage, which we can leverage to outplay weaker opponents post flop. Now, the next thing that we also always want to look at, and the last thing we want to look at, is the players that are left to act. So whenever you're considering calling a raise, you always need to see who's left to act. And we already kind of talked about this when we took a look at implied odds and good implied odds and stating that, well, if there's bad players left to act, then our implied odds are going to increase. But it's not only bad players. It's good players and bad players. So whenever we're considering cold calling a raise, always look at both the number of players and the types of players that are left to act. So in general, the more players that are left to act, I'm going to highlight this whole thing because it's very important. The more players that are left to act, the more conservative our cold calling range should be. Well, why is that? Well, it's twofold. So the reason is, is that the more players that are left to act, the greater the probability that one of our opponents will wake up with a premium strength hand, or there's going to be a good player left to act that is going to try to three bet squeeze us out of the hand. And we'll talk about squeezing later in this section. So the more players left to act, the smaller our calling range should be. And in addition to that, if they're going to have post flop position on us, well then now we're at a positional disadvantage to them as well, even though they're calling. So those are the different things that we want to look at in regards to cold calling and calling a raise preflop. Now let me go back to the slide that summarizes all of these. Now, this is not just only for cold calling. It's regards to calling a raise preflop, whether you're cold calling or you're overcalling. This is the criteria and the considerations that you want to consider. And same thing also if we go back to the gap concept. Again, this applies to calling raises in general. But because we'll be doing a lot more cold calling than overcalling, we're dedicating a section only to cold calling and of course we have specific ranges in regards to cold calling as well so if you have any questions please let me know if not thanks for watching and i'll see you guys at the next video take care